Today I'm going to discuss how to read a scientific paper in a way that will allow you to get the most out of it and um, understand what's going on even if you don't have a full understanding of all of the methodology. The first thing to keep in mind when you read a scientific paper is that you're not going to read it front to back. When you pick up a scientific paper, there are a few main questions that you should ask yourself. The first uh, is, what is the scientific question or the hypothesis that they have? A hypothesis is not a specific prediction about a specific outcome that's going to come from their experiment. Instead, a hypothesis is a larger scientific idea that they think explains um, something about the way, in this case, the brain works in a more general sense. So, for example, in this paper here, um, just looking at the title, um, we can see that the question that they are asking has to do with how the organization, topography, or mapping in um, a particular connection, which is excitatory connections from one part of the brain called layer 4 to another part called layer 3, um, develop. So, in other words, their question is, how does this particular excitatory connection in this particular region of the brain develop? As we get a little bit more practice reading scientific papers, we're going to start to distinguish question from hypothesis. Usually in a scientific paper, well, we're going to start to distinguish questions from hypotheses. Most scientific papers that get published confirm their hypothesis. But the hypothesis is a general idea or general rule about how, in this case, some uh, aspect of neuroscience works. In order to get at the hypothesis um, and in order to continue reading our scientific paper, the next thing that we read after the title is the abstract. Usually this is in bold, it's often not labeled as, as an abstract, um, but the first paragraph after the title and the names of the authors is the abstract. Reading through the abstract gives you an overview of the entire paper. Um, so they describe a little bit more um, of an introduction for what they are doing in this first sentence. Um, somatosensory cortex just refers to the area of the brain that, ex that, that senses touch. And if we back up to the title, um, in rodents, um, there's a particular subregion of the somatosensory cortex called the barrel cortex, um, which is receptive particularly to touch from the whiskers. Then they go on to discuss a little bit about the methodology. And so we're going to map out where the axons, where these projections are going in this particular connection from layer 4 to layer 2, 3 um, in this region of S1 or somatosensory cortex. The next couple of sentences begin to get into the results of what they do. So they first say in mature brains, and here mature is a little bit of a fluffy term because they're talking about 14-day-old animals um, as mature, 14 to 26-day animals as mature, um, which is really at best adolescence. Um, but nonetheless, they say, okay, so in these, in these mature um, uh, animals, they have axons from layer 4 extend um, into an area that is almost entirely in the home barrel column. Uh, now, you might not know what that means. We're going to see a little bit further on in the paper what that means exactly. Um, and so then we get to start to see what the newer uh, data is that they're contributing. Um, so they're looking at even younger animals. And what they find is that there is significantly less restriction to the column. Um, not knowing yet what really a barrel column is, um, this might be a little bit um, a little bit confusing, but we're going to just sort of roll with it for now um, and keep track of this as 
something that we need to hopefully get a little bit more understanding of as we get further into the paper. Um, and so then they start to um, put out some ideas that, um, uh, that uh, are going to be supported by some of their results, but they're also beginning to make some, uh, some broader claims and broader conclusions. So their claim here is that the mature organization or mature topography um, develops by targeting the axonal growth within the home column. So whatever this home column is, the axons are getting targeted more and more to that, to that area. Um, they then talk about um, another experimental manipulation. So backing up a little bit, that first experimental manipulation was just sort of an observation. We're comparing very young 8 to 11 day old animals with adolescent 14 to 26 day old animals. Um, now we're moving back to these young animals, but we're going to do something to them. Um, and this manipulation is that they're going to pluck out some of the whiskers. And so then again, we're getting back into some of the methodology that they're doing. When they pluck the whiskers on these rats, um, they, that does not alter the anatomical development. In other words, um, plucking the whiskers from these animals did not change the way they develop from this 8 to 11 day old range into the 14 to 26 day old range. Um, and so their, their conclusion then is that um, development of this projection does not require normal sensory experience after uh, age eight and is entirely predetermined. Um, and you can mess around with the way the animals are experiencing the world, completely deprive them of any sensory information from their whiskers and they're still going to have this sort of normal development of the organization of their axons. So at this point, now that we've finished reading the abstract, we have some ideas about what the experiment are and th uh, what the experiment is that they're doing. Um, but also getting back to our um, our sort of first point of what is the question or hypothesis that they're asking, uh, what we have figured out here is that their ultimate conclusion is going to be that sensory experience and sensory deprivation does not affect the development of this projection. So, but notice that the hypothesis is related to the question as we move forward through the paper, what we'll see is that they do not observe directly that experience does not change the organization. Rather, they collect a lot of data from many animals under different conditions, and that is what they're observing. And then their observations lead support to the overall broad hypothesis that experience and sensory input is not necessary for proper development of this particular connection. As we move on and get more sophisticated in how we approach scientific papers, we're going to emphasize more the distinction between the hypothesis and the predicted results or the results that they actually got. Okay. So we've made it through our title and our abstract. And now that we've done that, um, we have a good sense of the question and the hypothesis that they're asking. And we also have begun to get a flavor of some of the methodology and results that, they, that they're going to be showing us later. Next, we want to read through and understand the background work that they do. Um, this is very important for understanding their logic and reasoning. The introduction is usually one of the most approachable and understandable aspects of a paper. Um, it can get bogged down quickly in terminology. Um, fortunately for us, just with the abstract, we've already got a pretty targeted sense of where we're going. We want to um, understand the development of this projection, um, but especially uh, if you want to um, get a sense of other research, then this is very helpful. One way that I like to think about the introduction is that it's 
a scientific review that's written to prepare you for the study that they're going to do. Um, and so I'm not going to work through how to read the introduction here. Um, uh, you may run into some terms that you don't understand or that are unfamiliar in the introduction. Um, for now, just make note of those and keep going. Ultimately, our goal that we want to stay focused on is getting a relationship between their hypothesis and scientific question and their results. And so the introduction is just a chance for us to take a breath, see what else is out, see, see, see what else they think we might want to know beforehand. Coming up next in most scientific papers, and we'll see in, a, uh, in, one, in one of the next ones that we'll talk about a little bit later, um, a critical exception to this, but in most scientific papers, the next thing is materials and methods. Some journals have begun to put the materials and methods at the end. Other journals have begun to put the materials and methods entirely online. Uh, and the reason for this is because unless you're going to do these experiments yourself, the materials and methods is completely useless to you. Skip it. Don't read it. You will figure out what they do. They will explain their method at the level you need to understand it in the results section. Even professional scientists don't read this section unless they have some very specific question that they get after they've already read the rest of the paper. The data is always presented in figures, but those figures aren't always on the same page as the part of the results that is discussing them. Um, sometimes there are actually methodological figures as well, um, or figures that both illustrate some methodology and um, illustrate uh, some data. Um, and so as we read through this, we're not going to go through every single figure. One of the things that you could get out of the materials and methods section if it weren't um, an inside joke between the authors and um, their colleagues and in other institutions that are doing very, very similar work um, would be the next two questions that we need to ask, which are um, what's the experiment and what are the different conditions? Um, backing up to our abstract, we already kind of have a sense of the basic outline of this as well. Um, so at one very critical thing to keep track of in a scientific paper is that the experiment and the measurement are two very different things. They're often tightly related, but they are logically very, very different things. The experiment is what you change or what is different between two groups. So, for example, in our abstract, we already have a sense of what some of the experiments are. So basically, we've got three groups here. One is juveniles, which they're calling mature, um, that we haven't done anything special to. The second is young animals, that we haven't done anything special to. And then the third is um, animals that we plucked their whiskers out when they were young, wait until they get to be a little bit more mature, and then uh, look, at, look to see what's uh, going on in terms of their, of their axons. A closely related but importantly different question is what are we actually going to be measuring here? In the abstract, we kind of get a sense of this, that somehow we're measuring something about where these axons are going. In reading a paper, especially a paper that is not something that you're an expert in the field on, we're not so interested in what exact particular molecule did they use to, to make this measurement? Um, what exact particular thing did they do? Um, for in, in, in this class, there are some methods that we are going to dive deep into and some methods that you will have a good understanding of what's going on and what the measurement is. But for right now, um, approaching this paper from the perspective of somebody who doesn't do this kind of work, really we're just interested in a big picture sense, 
what are they measuring? So that's our next question. We know our experiment, we know our different conditions, now what are they measuring? So what they show us here in this first figure is that they have some way of finding an individual cell. Notice that they're talking about an individual cell that lives in layer four. So we have a cell whose cell body is in this zone of cortex called layer four. And they can fill it with some sort of dye. Um, it could be, you know, printer ink or whatever, as far as we're concerned. Um, they're just filling this cell completely with some sort of, uh, with some sort of dye. And then once this cell is completely filled with this dye, they can look at it under a microscope and see where all of its dendrites and axons go. It turns out that dendrites are usually fatter than axons. There are other ways as well to distinguish dendrites from axons. So looking over here at this image right here, um, the big fat black lines are our dendrites and these wispy thin little uh, spindly uh, uh, things are the axons of this cell. And so we go back to our title and our abstract here. We are most interested in the axonal topography. So as to our question of what they're measuring, they are measuring where the axons from these cells who live in layer four go. And in particular, they're interested in where they go within this region, up here in what's known as layer two, three. So that is our measurement. We are looking to see the shape and extent and spread of axons in layer two, three. And you should read through the results. Um, there are going to be, again, just like in the introduction, a lot of terms that you're unfamiliar with. But if you keep in mind the main idea that we have our three conditions, mature animals that we didn't mess around with, younger animals that we didn't mess around with, and then animals that we took away their whiskers so they had altered sensory experience when they were little, and then we're looking at them when they're mature. Keep in mind those three conditions and keep in mind our measurement. We want to know what is the spread of axon in layer 2-3 of the cortex. Here in figure 3, we're starting to see a little bit more of their methodology. And um, now we've got this idea that we saw in the abstract before, which is this home barrel column. And so that just means everything above the home barrel zone that this cell lives in. So any particular layer 4 cell has this little zone that it lives in. And our question is, if we ex make an imaginary extension of that zone up into layer 2, 3 here, how much of the axon from this cell stays directly above its home zone versus how much spreads out into the neighboring zones. And so there's some spherical coordinate system that they use to quantify this, but essentially what we're interested in is just that question how much stays within the zone. And if you read through the results more carefully, you'll see that that is their question. Okay, so, so like I said, first of all, we just did a developmental characterization, but our main hypothesis was about the relationship between sensory experience and, and this transition from broad axons to narrow axons. And there are two competing ideas here, right? One idea is that if we deprive the animals of sensory inf input, then they'll keep these broad axon or uh, this broad axonal organization. The other idea is that 
they're going to develop this way no matter what we do. And even if we take away all their sensory experience, they're just going to naturally going to de develop like this. And so before we go on to look at the results of the next measurement, we want to be sure that we know what our two competing ideas predict. Idea one that, that um, uh, is that there is a predetermined developmental uh, path, that it doesn't depend on sensory experience. Idea two is that this um, pa de developmental path will um, be altered by sensory experience, and maybe the animal will stay in this immature sort of structure um, with broad axons spreading out everywhere if we don't let it continue to have experience of the world. Over here, we have a summary of some of the critical data from this study. Remember, our first comparison was between the unaltered adults and the unaltered young animals. That is, adults is the wrong word. The unaltered juveniles, 14 to 26 days old, versus the unaltered younger, 8 to 11 day old animals. And so we look each dot here represents an individual cell. And so what we're going to measure here is of the total axon that extends into layer 2-3, what percent of that stays in this imaginary zone directly above this neuron's home barrel? Uh, for some of the neurons from young animals, a pretty high fraction, even a couple cases that are close to or at 100%, um, have all of their axon in the home barrel column, or a lot of the axon in the home barrel column. But across the entire population, we see that somewhere around half of the cells um, have 70% uh, have or less in the home barrel column meaning that somewhere between a third and even 90% or more of their axons don't even go straight up. They spread out into these neighboring zones in these young animals. By comparison, when we look at the older animals, um, these animals, almost all of the neurons restrict their axons primarily to their home barrel column. We can see an example of one here that is a, close to 100% of its axon is going straight up. This example over here, most of the axon is going straight up, but a little bit extends into the neighboring zones. So we say for each cell that they've looked at, what fraction stays in their home barrel column? And in the older animals, the mean is close to 85%. The standard deviation ranges from about 75% uh, to about a, to, to 100%. So, um, so that's our spread. There are a few neurons that have closer to 50% that stay in the home barrel column and then a little bit more spread out. But definitely, if we compare the population of young versus the population of old, animals, the older animals have a more restricted area that they send their axons to, and that restriction is that they send them mostly straight up. Our question now is, for the animals that were um, deprived of sensory input in various ways, how does that affect the way their axons are distributed as adults. So once again, as before, we're plotting on the y-axis the percent of the axon that is in their home column. Um, one thing to notice is that this y-axis, unlike back here, doesn't go from 0 to 100. They've just zoomed in on the 40 to, to 100 range, um, which makes it seem like the data is actually more spread out than it would be if we'd plotted it exactly the same way as we had on the last figure. Um, but still, we've got, so for our adults that were unmanipulated, 
Again, about 85% on average of the axon stays in the home column. Some cells, their axon stays completely in the home column. Some cells, they're only about half of their axons in the home column, but on average, it's about 80 to 90%. If we look at two different patterns of deprivation, and for right now, in this first read through the paper, we're not worried about the difference between these two. If you read the results section, they will explain the difference between these two. Um, but the sort of critical message here is that when you do these different types of sensory deprivation, we don't get any change in the overall spread of axons. These sensory deprived animals in sensory deprivation group A and sensory deprivation group B are statistically indistinguishable from the controls. And so that is our result. Um, and our hypothesis going in, um, we said, was that sensory deprivation would not change our, um, our projection. And in that case, now our results here support that hypothesis. This is another paper um, that uh, asks a very different question about motor control. Um, and uses very different sets of manipulations. Um, I'm not going to spend as much time on it, but I do want to highlight a few things about this one as well. Um, so in this paper, the question is, how is behavior altered in animals that have Parkinson's-like symptoms when we have this optogenetic control of the neuronal circuitry? So um, I will, for now, leave it up to you to come up with the exact question and hypotheses um, and also look at the results. But I do want to highlight two very important things. First of all, this paper is published in a different journal. And this is a sort of fancy, high-profile journal. And in these fancy journals, they don't distinguish for you what's introduction, what's results. And they are one of these journals that just doesn't even tell you the methods, or if they do, maybe they throw it in at the very end. So we can see. Yeah, they've got pages and pages at the very end that are methods, but it's thrown on as an appendix because most people, like I said, even practicing scientists, don't want to dig into the methods. It just gives you a headache. Nonetheless, there is a very important methodological way that we need to approach this. And I want to emphasize this again. We want to keep straight in our minds what the experiment is and the different conditions versus what they are measuring. And so in this paper, the experiment is, and the different conditions are that we have animals that are um, that have Parkinson symptoms that they've given that they, they've uh, created Parkinson symptoms by killing off some of the dopamine producing neurons in the animal um, compared to control animals. And also part of the experiment is that they've inserted this um, channel rhodopsin molecule, which is a protein, that allows researchers to use light to activate neurons. And so another experimental method, not a measurement, but a method, an experiment, is to compare the animals when we turn these targeted cells on versus when those cells were off. This is actually powerful for a lot of reasons, but one reason in which it's powerful is that it allows us to, in the same animal, say what, hap what is their behavior like when we have not turned these neurons on and their brain's just functioning how it always did versus when we artificially turn on this subgroup of neurons. Um, and that is not a measurement. That is an experimental manipulation that is going to form the basis of a comparison. 
So in this case, some of the comparisons that we're going to make is for a given animal, what was its behavior when we left it alone? And then what was its behavior when we turned on the light to alter its neural circuitry? <laughs> the measurements that they do in this are a couple things. One measurement that they do early on is measuring some neuronal activity. This is not critical to their experiment, but it is proving to anybody who wants to be convinced that, in fact, they are able to activate these neurons with light. The real measurement that they're making that relates to the scientific question, which you'll find if you read through the paper, is how much do these animals move? So their manipulation is two things. One, either normal animals or animals that have um, had their dopamine-producing neurons removed. And then two is animals that where we're turning, where we're leaving the brain alone versus animals versus that same animal when we shine a light on to turn on a certain group of neurons. So that's our experiment. Those are our different conditions. The measurement is really simple. We're just looking to see how much these animals walk around. And it's very critical that we keep straight that the experimental manipulation is turning on and off brain regions. And then what we're measuring, our data, is going to be behavior. And so we need to then know what's our hypothesis. What does our hypothesis predict about how this manipulation will change our measured behavior, and then what do we actually see with that measured behavior? Um, and a lot of times in an effort to present papers quickly in class, we move very quickly from point A to point B to point C of what's the question? What's the uh, experiments in the different conditions? What are the measurements? What are the predictions? What are the actual results? But those are the critical steps in reading and understanding any piece of scientific research, and you need to be absolutely clear on what each of those steps are, and um, the and and keep separate logically in your mind the hypothesis and question from the experimental manipulation and conditions, from the measurements that they're actually collecting. Um, uh, from the predicted results and from the actual results. And those are the key things to be aware of when reading any paper. A little bit later on, we'll get into some more detailed and more advanced questions. Um, but for now, those are the critical things to be thinking about when you're reading any scientific paper.